Hi, my name is Dr. Jackson Crawford. I'm a specialist in the Old Norse language, currently teaching at the University of California, Berkeley, previously at UCLA and some other institutions. Over the past year or so, I've been producing a series of videos on YouTube about topics in Norse language and myth. And today, for my subject, I'm going to take the first and, according to many, most significant poem from the Poetic Edda. Uh, the Poetic Edda is a compilation of about 30 poems in the Old Norse language written down in Iceland in the year 1270 and a manuscript usually referred to as the Codex Regius. The Poetic Edda has been translated into English numerous times. One of the most recent translations is my own, which is available from Hackett Publishing Company and which renders the poems of the Poetic Edda for the first time, not just in contemporary English, but also in a modern English verse, so that uh, hopefully the reading is more pleasant. The Volespo is the first poem in this collection. It has never been conclusively dated to the agreement of all scholars. I have a video in which I discuss the Poetic Edda and the Prose Edda, and some of the reasons why we think that many of the poems in the Poetic Edda are much older than the manuscript. I'll link that in an annotation and in the video description below. I also discuss the Prose Edda in the same video. Now, Volespa does have some archaic turns of language, and certainly by its pagan source material, seems to be somewhat early, but there's nothing that conclusively points to it being composed uh, particularly early in the Viking Age. Most people are content to date it to right around the time when Iceland would have been converting to Christianity, so right around the year 1000 AD. The name Volespo is a compound with the word spo, which means prophecy or vision of the future. Together with the possessive form of the word vulva. Now vulva is a, a woman with magical powers that seem particularly to relate to seeing the future. The vulva in the poem Volespa is not the only vulva in Norse literature. There's another famous example in the saga of Eric the Red, which also describes in some detail the clothing and preparations that the vulva makes. But this vulva is one of the most famous, and you can read Volespa then as meaning the prophecy of the prophetess, of the seeress, of the witch, of the woman with powers of seeing the future. Now, Volespa is a rare poem from the Poetic Edda in as much as it is preserved not just in our main manuscript of the Poetic Edda, the Codex Regius, but also in a manuscript from the mid-1300s called Huixpok. The version in Huixpok is longer than the version in Codex Regius, and it includes a next-to-last stanza that's not in the Codex Regius version, which says that one greater than all will come after Ragnarok. Most scholars have interpreted that, together with the somewhat more detailed vision of Ragnarok that is in the Hoeksbok version, as suggesting that the Hoeksbok version is a later version of Volespa, which has a more deliberate Christian influence on it. Then Snorri, in his prose edda, quotes much of Volespa. However, the version of Volespa that he knew differs somewhat from the version that's in either Codex Regis or Huxbog, and allows us to see that this poem was popular enough to exist in several different variations, even in the 1200s, 1300s, and uh, Snorri's quotes also help us understand some stanzas that might be garbled in transmission in the more complete manuscripts. The poem Volespa is written in Fornhildeslag, which is the most typical meter of mythical poetry in Old Norse. I have a video about Norse poetry and its structures, which I'll link in an annotation and in the video description below as well. Well, having introduced Volespa then, I'm going to narrate a little bit of what it says and quote some stanzas. The quotations that I'm going to give in Old Norse will be followed by a translation from my English translation. 
and the pronunciation that I'll use in Old Norse is the medieval reconstructed pronunciation that I use in my other videos for Old Norse. I'm a historical linguist and quite confident about my projection of what Old Norse would sound like. In annotations and in the video description below, I will link to videos about the pronunciation of Old Norse and modern Icelandic, the differences between them, and how we reconstruct the sound of dead languages. So, without further ado, the poem Volspa opens with the witch, I'll call her witch, Volva, speaking and addressing not just humankind, but Odin, who she says summoned her to give this account. In stanza one, she says, Kleus bidek alar kindir, meri op mini, bogu heim dalar, vildu at ek valfodr vel fyrtelia, forn spjol fyrra, thou were friends um man. Heed my words, all classes of men, you greater and lesser children of Heimdall. You summoned me, Odin, to tell what I recall of the oldest deeds of gods and men. When she refers to human beings as the children of Heimdall, this is probably a reference to the same myth as is preserved in the poem Rigsthula and the Poetic Edda, which tells of how uh, Heimdall, under the name Rigur, slept with the progenitors of the different human classes. So having addressed her audience, the witch then moves on to telling about creation. I have a video about creation uh, that I'll link in an annotation in the video description. Most of the details of the creation story that we know today come from Snorri's prose edda, where he tells it in a much more cohesive form. Volspo has only a sort of hinting presentation about the creation because she's painting a picture for an audience that probably already knows the details of the story. But she is immeasurably old, she says, in stanza two. Ek man jotna, orum borna, tho er hordum mik, fuda hovdu. Niu man ek hema, niu ivithur, mjotvit maram, fyrmold nethan. I remember the giants born so long ago. In those ancient days they raised me. I remember nine worlds, nine giantesses, and the seed from which Yggdrasil sprang. Then, telling about the gods and the decisions they make in creating the worlds, she reaches a point where the gods seem very happy. They live on a place called Idavolr, some kind of perpetually green plain, and they play with golden chess pieces and they're happy. But in stanza eight, their happiness is interrupted for the first time. Tevldu ituni, teti voru, varthem vetergis, vat orguli, uts thror komu, thursa moyar, o mat karmiok, oriotna hemum. They played in the grass, they were cheerful, they had no lack of gold. Till three giantesses came, fiendish giantesses, from Jotunheim. Jotunheim is the realm of the giants, the enemies of the gods. But right after this stanza, stanza 8, the witch skips to a completely new subject, at least it seems so to us as a modern audience. From stanzas 9 to 16, she's occupied with the dwarves and the god's decision to make the dwarves, and then she gives what purports to be a list of all the names of the dwarves. This is the famous catalog of the dwarves. From this catalog, J.R.R. Tolkien took the names of the dwarves in his book, The Hobbit. So you'll find Thorin, Oakenshield, Feely, Keeley, Bomber, etc. in this list. And you'll also find Gandalver, Gandalf, in this list. So from 9 to 16, she's talking about the dwarves. And then in stanza 17, she abruptly skips back to the creation myth. And this time, again, three come, and this changes the mood. So in stanza 8, three giantesses come, but then in stanza 17, three male figures come, Odin together with Hunir and Lothar, not very well described gods, and they make the first human beings out of trees. Uh, that's also discussed more in the creation video. Then in stanzas 19 to 20, she discusses Yggdrasil, the world tree, and the Norns, the three shadowy, 
women who control the fate of the gods and human beings and who tend to the tree Yggdrasil. Then we have a very shadowy story in stanzas 21 to 26 of the first war. Now, Snorri seems to interpret this as a war between the two major families of the gods, the Asir and the Vanir. But reading Volospil in isolation, it's really hard to tell who's fighting who and for what. Uh, and then there are two mysterious women figures mentioned. Uh, a Gulveig who was burned three times, as well as a Haver, who is a Volva, a witch or prophetess who sees good in the future, or who is good at prophesying. It's not even clear if these are the same woman, but it seems to imply that somehow that one of them, if they're not the same person, started this first war. We have uh, stanzas like this, stanza 24. Floig the Oven. Oki folkum skaut, that var en folkvig fyrsti heimi. Proten var borvegar borgar osa, knotu vanir vigspo, folus borna. Odin let a spear fly and shot it into the fray. That was the first war ever in the world. The outer wall of Asgard was broken. The Vanir knew war magic. They trampled the valleys. But then, having told about this first war, the vulva seems to come back to present tense, and she makes observations about some pledges made by gods. Both Heimdallr, who she seems to imply has given up an ear, and Odin, who she says gave up an eye and she knows where it is. She then says that Odin seems to pay her to continue. I'll read these stanzas 27 to 29. Veit hon heimdallar hljóð um folgit, ondir heið vonum helgum batni. Ós er hon ásask ergum forsi, af veði valfóðurs, vettuð er enn eða fátt. Ein sat hon úti þó er en aldni kom, ykjungar ósa og í eugu leit. Hvers fregnið mig, hví freistið mín, allt veit ek óðun, hvar þú auga fallt í ennum mæra mímis brunni. Drekker mjöð mímir morgen hverjan af veti valfóðurs, vittuð er enn eða hvað? Valdi henni herfóður hringa og menn, fe spjól spakleg og spógandu, svo hún vitt og um vitt og verrúð hverjan. I know where Heimdall hid his ear under the heaven-bright holy branches of Yggdrasil. I see a river that feeds the muddy waterfall where Odin's eye hides. Have you learned enough yet, Allfather? I sat alone when that ancient one came to me, Odin of the Asir, and he looked into my eye. What do you seek from me, Odin? Why do you seek me, Odin? Odin, I know where you hid your eye in the shining waters of the well of Mimir, but Mimir can drink every morning from those waters where your own eye drowns. Have you learned enough yet, Allfather? Odin opened my eyes to rings and necklaces. In exchange, he got wisdom and prophecy. I saw more and more, looking out over all the worlds. And notice that the phrase that she repeats at the end of stanzas 27 and 28, and which she will repeat again and again through the rest of the poem, is an Old Norse, Vituð eren eða fwat. Now, translating that extra literally, I would say, do you know yet or what? But who is you? She uses a plural form of you, so modern American English, you guys or y'all. But the plural you can be used as a form of respectful address to one individual. So I've usually taken this to mean that she's addressing Odin and asking Odin if he knows yet what he came to ask her or not. She almost seems to taunt him with this as she tells more and more about Ragnarok and the lead up to Ragnarok. Now, Odin, do you really want to hear more of this? At least that's how I personally tend to hear it. Now, having talked about these pledges, in stanza 30, she mentions she sees the Valkyries, and she names them. She calls them Skuld, Skogl, Gunnar, Hildr, Gondol, and Gerskogl. There are many more Valkyries named in other stories, so this doesn't seem to be a complete list. In stanzas 31 to 34, she hints about the story of Baldr being killed. 
uh, she sees Hodr, his blind brother, take a shot. And she sees an Avenger born and then one night old swear to kill Hodr and kill him, putting him on the funeral pyre. And she sees Loki punished. From Volospa alone, we wouldn't be able to make very much sense out of the story, but Snorri tells it in some more detail. And I give the bare bones facts in a video about the Norse gods. I'll link in an annotation in the video description. Then in stanzas 35 to 41, she sees a vision of Hel and of Jotunheimr, where the gods' enemies, the giants and the monsters, are preparing for Ragnarok. And then in stanza 42, we hear of the first sign of Ragnarok. Gor um osm, gulen kambi, so vekr holda at herja fodrs, en annar geldr hyrjort nedan, so trader hani at solum herjar. Near the Asir sings the rooster named Golden Comb. He wakes the men who fight for Odin, Lord of Battle. But another sings below the earth, a soot red rooster in the halls of hell. And now the second sign in stanza 43. Goir garm mjok fyr genipa heli, fester mun slitna en freki rena. Fjold veit hon fröda, fram se ek längre, um Ragnarok, rom sygtiva. Garm howls terribly before the doors to hell. The wolf will break its bonds and run. I know much wisdom. I see deep in the future, all the way to Ragnarok, a dark day for the gods. It's not particularly clear who Garmer is other than, quote, the dog of hell. Most people, because the dog is breaking out of bounds that have held it till Ragnarok, interpret Garm as Fenrir, the monstrous wolf who will eat Odin at Ragnarok. And I interpret it the same way, and I translate it that way in my translation. Now we hear in stanza 44 about what Ragnarok is, right, is like among human beings. Brother Muno Beriask, Okat Bonum Verla, Muno Sistrungar Sivium Spilla, Harteri Hemi, Hor Domer Mikil, Skegul, Skolmold, Skilder Klovnir, Bendul, Vargold, Oda Verud Stoipisk, Mun Engi Madr, Odrum Thirma. Brothers will fight one another and kill one another. Cousins will break peace with one another. The world will be a hard place to live in. It will be an age of adultery an age of the axe, an age of the sword, an age of storms, an age of wolves. Shields will be cloven. Before the world sinks in the sea, there will be no man left who is true to another. Now, more signs of Ragnarok. Stanzas 45 to 46. Leka mim sinir en myotodro kindisk at inu gala gyalar horne. Hot bless heimdalr horn ero lofti. Meller Odin with memes hold. Imerit Adna Tre and Jotun Losnar, Skelver Yggdrasil's Askar Standandi. The giants are at play, and the god's fate is kindled at the blast of Gjallar Horn. Heimdall blows that horn hard, holds it high aloft. Odin speaks with Mimir's head. The old tree sighs when the giant shakes it. Yggdrasil still stands, but it trembles. So even Yggdrasil, the world tree that's at the center of Norse cosmology, is being uh, broken and shaking. Now in stanzas 47 to 49, she talks about the giants and the monsters on their way. The preparations have been made, the warnings are out, and now they're moving. She mentions the ship Nagelfar, the nail, as in probably fingernail ship, that will be ridden by some of the enemies of the gods. And then in stanza 50, we have the tense moment as the gods and their allies wait. What are med olvum? Gnir aller Jotunheimr, Asir ru o thingi, Stynja dvergar fyr steindurum, Vegbergs visir, Vituteren eða hvat. What news from the gods? What news from the elves? All Jotunheim is roaring. The Asir are in council, and the dwarves, creatures of the mountains, Tremble by their doors of stone. Have you learned enough yet, Allfather? Then in stanzas 51 to 54, we have the duels between the leading gods and their enemies. Froer, the god of agriculture, will face off against Surtur, the fire giant. 
Thor will fight the Midgar Serpent, and they will kill one another. Odin will face Fenrir, the monstrous wolf. Fenrir will swallow him, but then Vidar, Odin's son, will avenge his father. And then, once the great gods have fallen, we read about the end in stanza 55. Sol tersortna, sigar foldimar, huerva av himni, heidar stjodnur, gesar emi, vid aldernara, lekar horhiti, vid himen sjolvan. The sun turns black, the earth sinks into the sea, the bright stars fall out of the sky. Flames scorch the leaves of Yggdrasil, a great bonfire reaches to the highest clouds. And so the tree that holds the cosmos together burns up. Then in 56, she repeats the ominous sign she saw in stanza 43, Fenrir howling, breaking his bonds. And she says once again that she sees all the way to Ragnarok, a dark day for the gods. But a new earth arises. In stanzas 57 to 62, she talks about this new world. And it's not just a new world for humans where the wheat will grow without anyone having to plant it but a new world for the gods. Baldr and Hodr will come back from hell and rule, and Hunir, the shadowy god who is with Odin at the beginning of the human beings, will come back too. The poem Va through this ball adds some other gods who will be back, like Thor's sons, Modi and Magni. And the surviving gods, or reinvigorated gods, will meet again on Ivavolar, where the gods met at the beginning of Bolaspol, with the golden chess pieces, and they'll enjoy a new hall, a place called Gimle. But stanza 63, the last stanza in Volospa and the Codex Regius, ends on a haunting final note that evil is forever in the form of the dragon Nidhogr. Thar kemr in dimi dreki flugandi, nadar fro nedan fro nida fjolum, ber seri fjodrum flieger vol ivir, nidhogr noi, lu. Monhon Sokvask. Then the dark dragon will come flying down from the dark mountains, that glistening serpent. Nidhogg will bear corpses in his wings as he flies over that valley. Now I must retire. And that is Volospo in summary. Note that in my translation of it, I take the Volva references to herself as both she and I, and consistently translate them as I to make it um, more consistent for an English readership today. Now, on a final note, I make these videos available for free because I don't think that knowledge is anyone any good locked inside a specialist head or in an ivory tower or behind archaic language. But if you like the work that I do, I encourage you to check out my Patreon page where I have rewards for supporters, which include special translations. For instance, I have a translation of the passage about the Volva and the Saga of Eric the Red, the opportunity to request your own translations, which I only do for Patreon supporters or on a commission basis, and other surprises like a rune font. From the University of California, Berkeley, I'm wishing you all the best.